This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. In Virginia, a woman is found dead on a lonely country road. Her husband claims it was a tragic accident, but the police believe it was murder. In Chicago and New York, over 5,000 people have been tricked into paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for worthless coins and a clever scam. Perhaps you can help catch these con artists. Mabel Woods loves dogs and has dedicated her life to providing shelter for homeless pets. For the last 18 months, someone has been waging a campaign of terror against Mabel and her helpless animals. We'll also tell you the story of five Hawaiian fishermen who vanished without a trace during a tropical storm. Almost 10 years later, their tiny boat was discovered over 3,000 miles from where they were last seen. Beside the boat, one of the sailors had been carefully buried. What happened to the other members of the lost crew? On the night of September 30th, 1987, a pickup truck was discovered on the side of a Virginia back road. The engine was running. The keys were still in the ignition. The transmission was in part. Beside the truck lay its owner, a 45-year-old woman named Kay Hall, crushed to death. Whoever operated the vehicle appeared to have backed over the center of her torso and probably on the bump from rolling over her with the left rear tire of the truck, then applied the brake suddenly, causing the vehicle to skid going backwards. The front tire, the left front tire, then caught her torso and pulled her backwards slightly and twisted her body on the roadway, which is how she was found, with the vehicle in park and the engine still running. After their preliminary investigation, authorities began to suspect that Kay's husband, Bob, had murdered her. They believe he had a possible motive for wanting Kay dead, as he stood to collect part of $50,000 that she had inherited the same day she died. Bob Hall also had no alibi for the period of time when Kay was killed. All I perceive is that the investigation has focused only on me and that I don't see any effort on anyone's part to look into the other possibilities. The death of Kay Hall is surrounded by events that seem to simultaneously indict and exonerate the prime suspect. For this reason, Bob Hall remains a free man. The case against him rests on time, an approximately 20-minute window of opportunity when Bob Hall could have stalked and run down his wife. Bob Hall freely consented to appear in this story, hoping that through its telling, his innocence will finally be established. Kay and Bob Hall lived and worked on the shores of Virginia's Karataman River, a tributary that empties near the western shore of the Chesapeake Bay. Kay was a successful insurance executive who left her career when she and Bob started an oyster farming business. They had been married since July of 1985, though Kay had known Bob for 12 years. The two became closer while Bob was serving two years in jail for selling drugs. She corresponded with him while he was in prison. And when he was released in January of 1982, Kay was waiting. It was quite an experience that Saturday morning. It was, uh, it was raining uh, about, about 7.30 and Kay pulled up in her little fiesta, and I could see the car way off in the distance and her waving at me. And between us was a very large electrical fence. 
And she very laughingly said to me, hey, you, Robert, I finally got you at last. And that was a, that was a good feeling. It was nice to feel wanted by somebody. Six months after the couple started their business, it began to run into financial difficulty. By many accounts, this contributed to tensions in the marriage. Both began to drink heavily. As time went on, I'd ask her, how's the business going? And I can tell it wasn't going so well. And then I'd say, well, and how's Bob? And I could tell that wasn't so good either. Well, it's about time, dude. According to friends, Kay and Bob's quarrels often began over trivial incidents. We're not taking the Jeep, we're taking the truck. Why? Why can't we take the Jeep? Because you got the DWI in the Jeep. That's Kay called me in the summer of 1986, and she started crying. And she said, we're taking the Bob truck. is abusing me physically. He's abusing me. He beats me up. And that's when she started to talk about going into therapy, trying to get into marriage counseling with Bob. And if that didn't work, that she would definitely consider divorce. Conversation about divorce uh, probably came up as frequently as it would in any uh, couple's relationship where there were problems. And the problems were essentially money. The, the oyster business had not treated us with great kindness. We had lost an awful lot of money on it. On September 30th, 1987, Kay's fortunes turned. She had recently received a $50,000 inheritance, and in a local post office, she mailed papers that officially transferred half of the money into her account. That morning was to be Kay Hall's last. That evening, Kay and Bob went to a party at the local country club. Many of Kay's friends were there, and by all accounts, she was the life of the party. We got to the party probably around 20 after 6. And Kay was, I know, was thoroughly enjoying herself. You could just see the magic, you know. Kay walked in, and then all of these faces just seemed to turn. There's Kay, and all of a sudden, things seemed to be complete. Thank you, babe. Thank you. You have one for the road, will you, Melanie? As the evening progressed, Kay and Bob continued to drink. You ready to go home? Just a couple minutes. Having a good Thanks. time? Mm -hmm. Well, not as good as you. Then Kay became upset. No, Some okay. say by the amount that Bob tipped the bartender. <laughs> Kay left the country club without her husband and drove away in their pickup. A few minutes later, as he was left without a car, Bob was driven the 14 miles to his home by friends. At approximately 9.55 p.m., two carloads of people leaving a different dinner party happened upon a shocking scene. There was a truck sitting there off to the side of the road with the lights on, and there was a body underneath the front wheel. We felt her pulse to see whether she had a pulse. We couldn't find one, but that was when we discovered that she was just as warm as you and I are right now. So she, what, what had happened had just happened very, very recently. By the time the paramedics arrived, it was too late. A little over two hours after leaving the country club, Kay Hall was pronounced exactly dead. The, way you found it. Yes, sir. the reconstruction from witnesses at the scene was that she had been found under the left front tire of her own vehicle. Apparently, the vehicle had backed over her while she was lying on the road. There were some signs, which we later found in the truck, that indicated there was a scuffle inside the cab of the truck. But Kay's purse was still intact. It had all her money and credit cards and so forth in it. Also, it did not appear that there was any sign of a sexual assault. She was fully clothed. The autopsy result showed that she was intoxicated at the time of her death, a rather high level. She very well could be, have been disoriented, which would have caused her to have taken the wrong turn and might have put her in the area where she was found. Bob and Kay's domestic problems, coupled with the $50,000 that she had just inherited, led to Bob Hall being considered a prime suspect. 
Bob Hall has no alibi for the approximate one hour period between the time friends dropped him off at home at about 8.45 and the time that he placed a phone call from his house at 9.47. During this hour, Kay was killed. If Bob had murdered her, it only could have occurred within a narrow period of time. Shortly after 8 p.m., Kay left the country club located here. Bob was dropped off at his home here, 15 miles from the club at 8.45 p.m. Just over an hour later, at approximately 9.55 p.m., Kay was found dead at this spot, just two miles from the club. Bob Hall would have had only one hour to drive to the murder site, somehow find his wife in the darkness, kill her, and then race back home in time to place his 9.47 p.m. phone call. Special Agent Riley retraced the drive from the Hall home to the death site several times. I measured the distance between the Hall residence and the spot where Kay was found. The distance is between 14 and 15 miles. I could drive it in as little as 17 minutes if I drove it in a pursuit fashion, and if I drove at a leisurely pace, it took as much as 24 minutes. If Bob had left home immediately at 8.45 and driven directly to where Kay's body was found, he would have arrived at about 9.05. In order to make his 9.47 phone call, Hall would have had to have left the scene no later than 9.30 p.m. This would have given him no more than 25 minutes to track down and murder his wife. It's terrible to have somebody taken from you in this way, and particularly when nobody has been able to do anything about it. So I really, I don't know that, that I can rest until we, till we see justice served and the murderer is apprehended and convicted. They apparently do not have any, any, uh, anyone else to, uh, to focus in on. And being put in that spotlight has been tough. I love Kay. I'm looking forward to, for, to this, this whole incident being resolved. Uh, I'd like to see you know, Kay to literally be put at rest and uh, have some peace in my life and, uh, and her family's life. In a moment, we'll update the story of an injured Vietnam vet who for 21 years has been searching for the nurse who helped him learn to walk and talk again. Three weeks ago, we presented the poignant story of an Army helicopter pilot, Jim Meade, who was severely injured when he was shot down in Vietnam in 1967. Tonight, the heartwarming ending to Jim's story. Jim's war wounds left him in a coma from which doctors feared he would never recover. Hi, Jim. How are you feeling? Jim eventually came out of his coma, but had no memory of his first 19 years. He had even forgotten how to walk and talk. Then he met an Army physical therapist named Lieutenant Stevens. I know you're hurting, but you can't give up. Now straighten it out. Come on, work hard. Come on. For the next nine months, there with the help and encouragement of Lieutenant Stevens, Jim struggled to go. regain his speech and motor skills. There you go. Uh, I don't know if I would have learned to do these things uh, without her. Like I always yeah. wanted to get better, sure. learn things so I can Good. show her Good. how much I'd improve. It was always important to me. Nearly one year after Jim arrived at the hospital, Lieutenant Stevens left the Army. She never saw Jim again or had any idea that she set him on the path to recovery. If I saw her now, I don't know what I'd do. I just know this it's always been important for me that she knows that I'm OK. The morning after our broadcast, Jim Mee's 15-year search came to an end when he received a phone call from one of our viewers. I was watching TV, and I saw Jim at the beginning of the program. 
And I said to my family, I treated that fella when I was in the service. And the next remark was that they were looking for Lieutenant Stevens. And I thought, well, that was my maiden name. And at that point, I realized that this was going to be more than just a program to watch. On September 25th, nearly 21 years after they said goodbye, Jim and Karen reunited. Oh, it's good to see you. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. You look wonderful. When Karen came to the door, I went and, um, if somebody else saw her, they might say that Karen's changed 200%. And my heart, Karen, hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> and I'm glad to tell her thank you. <laughs> the reunion today has been everything I expected it to be. It's, it will stand out as one of the most exciting days of my life. Uh, it's thrilling to see someone that has come back so far and made a success of their life. But a lot of people had a lot to do with Jim Mead's recovery. I was just a small part. It would be very difficult for me to put into words what this day has meant to me. It just makes the future that much brighter because I do know that now the dreams do come true. New Yorkers have a reputation for being streetwise and savvy. They can take care of themselves. No one is going to pull a fast one on them. Yet each year, New Yorkers lose four times more money to scams and con men than to bank robbers. Over the past 15 years, at least 5,000 people have fallen prey to a very clever, highly organized scam. Jerry Diner was a typical unsuspecting victim. I was at a telephone in Midtown outside. And uh, as I finished up my call, a okay. guy comes up right. to me. He sounded kind of drunk. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah? Uh, I just found this bank envelope on the street, and this was inside of it. Uh -huh. I was wondering if you'd do me a favor. Uh, could you call what? this guy up and, and tell him I found this? Because I want to give it back to him. And okay. he's holding a bank deposit envelope, and it's got Dr. Stone and the address. And uh, in his other hand, he's got these coins. And he couldn't make the telephone call himself. Okay, calm down, man. I'll I finally get the doctor on the phone, and I said, I don't know how to explain this to you. I got a guy here, and um, uh, he found an envelope that has your coins in it. You found my coins? No, 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 I, I don't talk on the phone. I'm, and I'm I said, uh, no, doctor, I don't know what to do here. And the doctor says, um, look, if you could give him $100, then, uh, you know, I'll add that $100 onto, there's a $1,000 reward. I don't have a hundred dollars. You see, I'm a coin collector. I've lost those coins. They're very valuable. So I said, I don't know what to do here. You know, he won't uh, come to you. Can you come down here? And the doctor says he can't come down there. Okay, if I can do anything, I will. Well, I certainly would appreciate it. Thank you very much. As it turned out, the phone number Jerry dialed was not a doctor's office, but a pay phone, and the man he spoke with was a con artist. What allowed me to be scammed was that it was totally non-threatening. It was always up to me. I could walk away or I could go that next step further. When he was really drunk at the telephone, I could have just said, look, I can't handle this, Dr. Stone, boom, I'm out of here. Joe. What? Look, how much do you want for those coins? I, I just want a place to stay, something to drink, something no, to I eat. No, I understand that, I understand that, but exactly how much do you want for the coins? A uh, hundred dollars. A hundred dollars, all right, look, here's what I'll do. I'll take you over to my bank machine, and I'll get you a hundred dollars, and I'll take the coins over to the doctor. You do that for me? Yeah, sure. Oh, Come you're on. a saint. Come on. And I give him $160. I mean, it's worth it to give him the extra money. And I'd like to say, you know, that I'm like really a good person and that there was no greed involved. But it was kind of like an illegal thing that was going on because I was going to take those coins. I'm giving him 160, but, you know, I'm going to make five times that. So, yes, there was, um, uh, you know, that illicit kind of feeling of, you know, well, I'm doing something a little weird here, and, uh, you know, and I'm going to get away with it. In this scam, the con man carefully selects people who appear to be affluent, 
or who might be able to easily get cash from a bank teller machine. Once the fake transaction has gone down, he simply disappears into the crowd. I don't know anything about coins, so I thought I was doing a favor for the doctor. But in the cab, I looked at the coins, and it said rare on the coins. But then it listed the amounts. And one was 1350 one was 600 and one was like 300 And I'm going, why would he offer a $1,000 reward for coins that are only worth like 2000 That seemed like a little weird to me, but I figured, well, they really mean something to this guy. Most of the people taken in by this scam are sent to the same apartment building on the Upper East Side, which they believe to be Dr. Stone's office. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm looking for Dr. Stone. Well, I'm sorry. There's no Dr. Stone here. What in the mean? last few years, we've estimated that about three or 4,000 people have, have actually come here with this coin scam. A lot of the times when these victims come here, they believe that in some way, myself or whoever else is working here that's in the lobby, is an accomplice to this. And, um, you know, I always try to explain to them, if I was running this scam, would I actually bring you back to me? I never thought that I was being scammed for one second, not even for a millisecond. I was just caught up in this. I really want to thank you for this. Okay. I really felt right. like I was doing a good deed and making money at the same time. This simple but plausible scam has suckered people in New York, Florida, Boston, and Baltimore. In most cases, the coins that are sold are like these. An English 25 pence worth about 35 cents. A fake California gold rush coin, which is totally worthless. And an Indian penny worth no more than 50 cents. The total value of these three coins is no more than one dollar. If you're approached by one of these con artists, for heaven's sake, don't buy these coins. Immediately contact your local law enforcement agency. Next, the story of a woman who provides shelter for homeless animals. She is being terrorized by an unknown assailant. The Humane Society of the United States estimates that last year alone, over 12 million stray and abandoned cats and dogs were taken in by animal shelters nationwide. Sadly, over 7.5 million of these animals were never placed in homes and had to be destroyed. In southern Missouri, 68-year-old Mabel Woods has dedicated the past 15 years of her life to running an animal sanctuary that provides a loving and caring home for dogs that might otherwise be impounded. But in recent years, Mabel and the dogs she cares for have been the target of a campaign of terror. How long have you been on the road? Four and a half years ago, when Mabel moved to the small rural community of Bon Terre, located 60 miles south of St. Louis. I was raised on a farm. I always loved animals. My dream was always to have lots and lots of animals. Come to Mama. Oh, you're beautiful. Where did you come from? Hmm? You want to go home with me? Let's take you home, give you something to eat. Hungry? Every time I would go to the store, I would see strays. Well, it ruined the whole evening if I saw a dog that was obviously lost. All right, get in there. Finally, I fulfilled my dream of having a place I could keep them. And um, I can't take all the strays, of course, but I take a great many. Mabel bought a 110-acre farm and built a $60,000 kennel to house many of the 115 dogs she was caring for. The dogs were offered for adoption, but those that didn't find new homes lived out their lives on the sanctuary. Mabel felt the farm was an ideal location because her nearest neighbors are over a mile away and would not be disturbed by the dogs. You are okay. I love you. You're beautiful. <laughs> Eighteen months after she moved to the farm, Mabel's peaceful life was shattered. On the night of December 11th, 1986, someone broke into Mabel's kennel. The 
intruder fired at least four rounds of a 22 caliber rifle, killing two dogs and seriously wounding two others. The next morning, when I went up to open the kennel, I found my dogs dead. In the beginning, I thought, oh, there's been a fight. They killed each other. But as I looked, I, I realized that they had been shot. And I rushed two of them, one a big collie to the vet, and uh, he was saved. Well, he was shot right in the, right in the nose. It's, it's a miracle that he's even living because he was laying in a pool of blood when I found him. I was upset about it, and I called the sheriff's office, but I knew there was nothing, really nothing, that could be done at that point, probably. Police officials investigated the shooting, but because the killing of an animal is a misdemeanor, the case was given a low priority. After the shooting, Mabel hired Charlie Jacobs to help around the kennel. Charlie moved into the guest house and doubled as a hired hand and night watchman. Come here, girls. Come on. For two months, nothing unusual happened. Mabel and Charlie settled into a comfortable routine. Come on. Hi, girls. How you doing, huh? Good night. Hey, love. On the night of February 10th, 1987, Charlie made his final rounds as usual. I went back down and stopped at our barn, turned the light off there, and walked on down to the garage where I met Mabel. We talked for a few minutes and turned the lights off there again. Around 1 a.m., Charlie was in his kitchen when he noticed a bright orange glow through the window. What the hell? 50 yards away, the kennel was in flames. By the time Charlie reached the kennel, he was completely engulfed in flames. Inside were 60 dogs. They had no way to escape. It was awful. The flames were real high, and you hear a few yipes every once in a while. And the place was on fire. I mean, it's like an inferno. Charlie managed to pull one back from the flames, but could do nothing to save the other 59. no reason for the kennel to burn because the kennel was so new, a great deal of it was green lumber. The dog houses were burning from the inside, not outside, but from inside. I knew it had to be arson because the dogs were blazing, which they would not have been without something put on them. Fire officials told Mabel that the blaze had first been reported by a neighbor. The fire was so intense that it set off smoke alarms in homes over a mile away. Have you had any problems with anyone recently? No, we haven't. Have you noticed anybody around the property that shouldn't be around the property? All I could think of is why anyone would do such a thing. Also, the fact that the last thing I've always done is tell the dogs I'm glad I've got them and that they're safe. As I watched the kennel come down to the ground and realized that my dogs were all dead, I couldn't, I just couldn't realize why anyone would do that. And there just wasn't anything left except a few scraps of metal in the concrete. Four days after the blaze, the local volunteer fire department began an investigation headed by investigator Charlie Giesing. 
we went to interview the local people, and a lot of people were surprised that she even existed back on this farm. Nobody knew Mabel Woods was back there. Butch, charge your lines and we can get this cleaned off. We wanted to clean off the debris of the, the barn to get a look at the floor. We started to see a pattern that's called spalding develop. Spalding occurs when a flammable substance is ignited on concrete. The extreme heat causes the concrete to crack or erode. This pattern is not normal in a fire. It led to, to the assumption that the fire was set with a flammable liquid. We believe that night that the suspect entered the building through the, the door they used normally to get between the two rolls of pins. He entered the building, poured a flammable liquid down the walls as he went in. The hallway led to a bigger open area at the far end. He continued pouring the wall. At that point, that was probably when he lit it, and then he took off. Once it was determined that arson was the cause of the fire, police officials joined the investigation. 100 yards from where the kennel once stood, they found a tire track in the mud. Somebody left out in a hurry. They made a plaster mold of this track. It and the spalling patterns burned into the kennel floor are the only evidence police have in this case. I get somebody out here to get this thing photographed. Ready? Let's radio in. We don't have any leads. Don't have any suspects that haven't been eliminated. Most of the people that you find in this part of the country are dog lovers. We have dogs, we have hunting dogs. We care a lot about our dogs. There's people in this county who would shoot you a whole lot quicker over their dog than they would their wife. Within 10 months of the fire, Mabel had built a new kennel. She is still haunted by the memory of that tragic night and fears that whoever was responsible may strike again at any time. When I rebuilt my kennel, I built it right onto my house. So it's hard to tell where, where my territory ends and the dogs begin. And then, to make them even safer, I built an eight-foot masonry wall all the way around. I know someone could scale it, but also at night, or if I'm gone, I have a couple of big dogs that I let out. And the dogs do not like people. Our concern for Mabel's safety is an ongoing thing. We keep an eye on that lady. We keep an eye on her property. Mabel's unknown enemies have continued to terrorize her. In the two and a half years since the fire, 40 pounds of nails have been spread across her driveway. She has received numerous death threats on the phone. On two separate occasions, her house has been shot at. And just recently, graffiti with a sinister warning Quiet or die was painted across the entrance sign to her kennel. There we go, there we go. One for you. Mabel's friends and family fear for her safety. They have urged her to move, but Mabel is determined to stay. I thought about it and I decided this was a perfect farm. It's it's very pretty. I've got the creek which I love. I decided I am not going to leave. It is my farm. I bought it, paid for it and I'm staying. In a moment, the story of five Hawaiian fishermen who vanished in a severe storm. Almost 10 years later, clues to their fate were found on a remote Pacific island 3,000 miles away. Did some of the crew survive? The Hawaiian island of Maui one of the nation's most beautiful tourist centers. But Maui is also dotted with tiny villages dependent on the unpredictable Pacific for their livelihood. 
One of these traditional fishing villages is Hana, a town of approximately 1,200 people located on Maui's southeast shore. February 11, 1979. On the spur of the moment, five local men took the day off, planning on a few hours pleasure fishing in their 17-foot Boston whaler, the Sarah Joe. When they left at about 10 in the morning, um, the water was very calm and it was a nice clear day and uh, they gathered their equipment together and prepared the boat. The five friends who went fishing that morning were Benjamin Kalama, Ralph Maliakini, Scott Moorman, Patrick Woosner, and Peter Hanchett. Between them, the men had over 50 years of seagoing experience. Maliakini earned his living as a professional fisherman. As the Sarah Joe left the harbor, the weather was fair. But at 1 p.m., a freak wind swept in from the mountains, the first warning that a storm was about to strike, a storm as dangerous as it was unexpected. The wind switching around, instead of coming from the normal direction, which is from the east, northeast, it switched and came from the mountains, going out to sea. And this concerned me a great deal. So I told Dave, say, we better get down the coast, see if we can spot those boys and wave them in. Within hours, the storm arrived in all of its fury. John Hanchett went out into the teeth of the gale to search for the Sarah Joe and his son, Peter. By this time, it was really blowing a gale and the rain was beginning to come down and it was storming. And we went out of Hana Harbor about a half a mile and then down the coast. And I still didn't see any sign of the boys, but it was a very rough trip. And the oceans were fierce. Uh, I'd never seen them get that rough. Hanchett continued his search the next day with the help of marine biologist John Norton. It made quite an impression on me to see uh, to think that this man was out all day yesterday in, in uh, 30 to 40 knot winds and 20 to 25 foot seas in this channel looking for his, uh, for his son. You're hoping coming in that someone had seen something during the day and they'd have some encouraging news, but they had the same news that we brought in that was there was no sign of the boys, no sign of the boat, no sign of anything. The next day, the Coast Guard continued the search for the Sarah Joe. The initial place where you start searching was very ill-defined because we weren't really sure exactly where the Sarah Joe had gone fishing. So it encompassed a relatively large area initially that first day, and then the area gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But when the conditions are rough out, it's very difficult, whether you're in the air or in the, on the water, and combine that with the, the fact that the Sarah Joe was, was uh, a turquoise blue color with white trim in an ocean that's turquoise blue with white white caps. It would have been very, very difficult. When the search was finally suspended, five days later, we had searched 73,000 square miles. During the following weeks, the residents of Hana combed the nearby beaches, looking for the wreckage of the Sarah Joe. Finally, they gave up the search never gave up hope. And these people are not going to become obsessed with impossibilities, but uh, on the other hand, uh, they don't forget. Heavenly Father, we ask thee to be amongst us this time as we unify our love. And our to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Sarah Joe's disappearance, the family and friends of the missing sailors gathered on the pier where the five men departed. Help us to understand what we have all been through. As time passed, it seemed that memories were all that were left of the missing men and the Sarah Joe. And for all that we share today and always, amen. On September the 9th, 1988, the story of the Sarah Joe took a bizarre turn. Captain, come take a look at this. 10 years after the tiny boat disappeared and 2,000 miles west of Maui in the Marshall Islands, a wrecked boat was spotted on the tiny island atoll of Tiongi. Incredibly, 
The man who first saw it was John Norton, the marine biologist who had searched for the Sarah Joe back in 1979. At first, we thought it was a boat uh, moored offshore. So we approached closer. And then we saw that it was a uh, uh, what looked to be a, a battered small boat on the uh, island itself. Norton and his crew landed to examine the wreckage. As we rounded a bend uh, in the island on the windward side there, we could see the white hull of the boat. And on the starboard uh, bow, uh, there were still a few letters and numbers uh, from the registration number. And uh, immediately I saw the it started with an HA, which indicates that the boat was registered in the Hawaiian Islands, which of course is over, over 2,000 miles away. Approximately 60 yards away from the wreckage, Norton's companions hey, discovered a makeshift grave. We walked over there, and they were standing over a, a pile of coral rocks with a crude wooden cross sticking out of it. And um, so when like we got up there, we could see there. immediately that there was a human jaw bone uh, protruding out of, the, out of the pile of rocks. At that time, we had no way of knowing that the grave site was associated with the wrecked whaler, although we had a fairly good, we had a, we had a feeling that it may be because it was in such close proximity. Somebody obviously had to bury the guy, and, and they may still be on the island here. We've got a really the men found no evidence that the island was inhabited. Norton recorded the registration Let's numbers of the out. whaler and left the site undisturbed. The Coast Guard ran a check of these numbers and made a positive identification. The whaler was the Sarah Joe. It was so amazing that Norton would end up finding the boat and the grave and things like that. I haven't, I hadn't seen him in the meantime. After the Coast Guard identification of the wreckage, the grave was excavated and a partial human skeleton was uncovered. Dental records revealed that the remains were those of one of the five missing men, Scott Mormon. Another strange clue surfaced when unusual pieces of paper were discovered in the grave. These papers had been buried deliberately. It was a sheaf of, of paper, and I'd say a book, except it was not bound, probably three inches by three inches by maybe three quarters of an inch thick. But between each one of these pieces of paper, there was a very small square piece of, of tinfoil material. We have not been able to determine who placed that there or, or what purpose it serves. Experts agree that the Sarah Joe could have drifted the 2,000 miles to the Marshall Islands a chain of tiny islands in the western Pacific. This voyage should have taken three months. But according to the brother of one of the missing men, a U.S. government survey of Tiangi in 1985 found no trace of the Sarah Joe. If this is true, then where was a Sarah Joe during the six years between its 1979 disappearance and this 1985 survey? In 1985, he said there was no Sarah Joe. No Sergio on the Tiongi Island. Where was the Sergio? What happened to the Sergio during these six lost years? Where were the five missing men? Who buried Scott Mormon and why? And perhaps most importantly, could any of the men still be alive? Every time I look at the ocean, my thoughts go to him. I see him way out in the island someplace, alive and waiting. We want to know what happened to the other boys. Were they on that island with the boat and with Scott? Uh, or what? Maybe someone around has some information that can enlighten us on that. Finally tonight, another edition of FBI Alert. The FBI hopes that someone in our audience can help solve a particularly shocking crime committed just last month, the kidnapping of a baby boy only three days old. Avery James Norris was born last September 18th at Sinai Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. At 11.30 on the morning of September 21st, a woman disguised as a nurse entered the maternity ward and encountered Avery with his mother, Linda Norris, in her hospital room. Apparently familiar with hospital routines, she instructed Linda to hand her the baby and to return to bed for a physical examination. 
After pulling the privacy curtain around the bed, the woman and Avery disappeared. This has really been, um, I guess, one of the hardest things I've have to ever had to face in my life. Um, I can't imagine going on from day to day without having him back. Avery weighed 8 pounds 12 ounces at birth, is circumcised, and has an oval birthmark on the inside at the top of his right leg. His alleged kidnapper has been described as a light-skinned black female and maybe Pakistani or Indian. She is 30 to 35 years old, 125 pounds, with a stocky build and shoulder-length black hair. We believe that the individual who abducted Avery Norris is a person who has an emotional need. Now, the individual may change the appearance of the child, but she's still going to be proud of this child, and she's going to want to let individuals know that she does have it. Tonight, we're happy to report that Avery James Norris is back in the loving arms of his parents, that his alleged abductor is behind bars. On November 15th, the Maryland State Division of Vital Records received a call from a woman who claimed that she had given birth to a baby boy at her home two months earlier. The caller, 33-year-old Carlene Victoria Wilkinson, said she wished to obtain a birth certificate for her son, Tavon Anthony Wilkinson. Authorities immediately became suspicious and began an investigation. A DNA test later confirmed that Tavon Anthony Wilkinson was actually Avery James Norris. On November 16th, two-month-old Avery James Norris went home with his parents for the first time. We're very happy. This is day one. We start our life right from today. But I'd just like to thank all the people who called and all the people who sent letters and cards and who prayed for us. And I thank you from, from my husband and myself and for our baby. Before we say goodnight, a piece of good news. Last week, we told you of a con man who infiltrated a Florida nudist camp and fled after being charged with fraud and child molesting. Just 12 hours after our broadcast, he was arrested, thanks to information called in by our viewers. We will have a complete story of his dramatic arrest on one of our next editions of Unsolved Mysteries.